All right, good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate the opportunity uh, once again uh, to talk in this uh, lovely country. So what we're going to talk about today is kind of my experience and what the literature says about adjustable loop buttons and soft tissue grafts, uh, exactly what I did this uh, morning when I did the HCL on the femur. So I'd like to thank the Pew Synthes, Sports Medicine Tom, I'd like to thank the faculty, and Dr. Kevin Bonner, who I borrowed some of his slides from. So when we're talking about an ACL, I try to keep things very simple. Like if you saw my plan uh, this morning on the video, I keep things very simple. I'm like, I want to put a hole here, I want to put some stitches here, and I'm going to do my job. And so I try to break down my ACL into five parts. And what we're going to talk about in this talk are these four parts. Preparing the graft, our femoral and tibial tunnel, which can both be done inside out if you desire, and then femoral tunnel fixation. So. First and foremost, do soft tissue grafts I work? I know that's a big, uh, y'all like your soft tissue grafts in India. So let's have a look at the literature. So here's a meta-analysis, several of them showing no functional difference in outcome, no functional difference in static stability, uh, excuse me, no functional difference in outcome, increased static stability with the patellar tendon, but also increased morbidity. Uh, real quick, the best way to make sure your patients don't have anterior knee pain after a patellar tendon is you, you don't ask. So <laughs> the, here's a level one, level two study looking at patellar tendon and hamstrings. And what they're showing is no clinical outcome difference in failure rates. Uh, the BTBs did have an overall increase in anterior knee pain, and they thought the hamstrings had an increased laxity and less knee flexion strength. Again, this is stuff we know. Level one study and meta-analysis, four-string hamstring ACL is comparable to patellar tendon and function and uh, stability. And the hamstring appears to carry a less risk of, thank you, of uh, anterior knee pain. Let's look at arthritis. Uh, many people think a patellar tendon is going to have higher arthritis. I, I agree with this article by Dr. McCarty, who's fantastic. I think you start the process of arthritis the moment you tear your ACL. Look at the pivot to shift contusion pattern and the injury to the bone and the cartilage. Uh, but hamstrings and uh, patellar tendon have similar experience with postoperative arthritis, long term follow up, and I'd argue to say a quad tendon will as well. So, but now let's dive in a little deeper, right? It's not all apples to apples in the literature. I think what we're starting to see is in our younger patients, we're seeing here in 988 patients that are young, we're seeing that patellar tendon has a lower failure rate than hamstring. In fact, hamstring has a 3.6 higher failure rate times failure rate than patellar tendon. But that's in young people under the age of 20. Furthermore, in this article, they showed a 6.5% failure rate in hamstrings and 2.1% in patients under the age of 25. Over the age of 25, no difference. Same thing in this article, slightly different. 15 to 20 year age group, a slightly higher rate, almost three times higher in hamstring than BTB. And at 21 to 25, no difference. So I think we need to look at our patients. In the United States, we have this saying, um, you can't get hit by a car if you don't cross the street. Young people cross the street a lot more than people my age or your age in this room. So I think we have to acknowledge that and think of them a little differently. So how do we decrease the risk of a hamstring failure? Aside from doing a good ACL, putting our tunnels in the right position, assuming you do all that correctly, which I will, because I've seen how good a surgeon y'all have in this country. The reality is this is a study out of 2012 out of Duke. Um, it's about the size of the graft, right? Grafts that are greater than eight millimeters have an under 2% failure rate. Graphs under eight, mi under eight millimeters, it's gonna be as high as 14 to 7% failure rate. So size does matter, and I'll give Dr. VJ a lot of credit today in our surgery. Our graft size was seven millimeters. He folded the graft on itself to make an eight and a half and nine millimeter graft. He did a wonderful job. So my technique, uh, I like the speed trap. Uh, today we didn't have the smaller one, but the speed trap is, very, is a very quick way to prepare your graft. I'll do this in live time and then I'll speed up the talk afterwards. But basically you have your assistant pulls counter traction. I pull the graft through the device right here and all I have to do is pull these two sutures and it'll cinch down on the graft very quickly. And it's a very gentle, nice way to pull, to fix your graft without putting uh, holes through a possibly smaller graft. I even folded the end of the graft back on itself to make it thicker, and there it is that quickly. Um, so does it work? So Dr. Barber, again, who does a lot of the Reader's Digest comparing implants uh, literature, compared 
speed trap, crack owl, fiber loop, all the different knots. And he showed that speed trap was by far the quickest and that speed trap and fiber loop were the strongest. However, the caveat here is with fiber wire, all the other implants failed at the suture. Fiber wire destroyed the tendon. So that's where I think suture does matter. You got to be careful of the suture. So speed trap is by far the most efficient and strongest and safest graft preparation currently on the market. Uh, this is the twister. What I, I video, but this is an in Mitex Depuy Synthes Sports Medicine inside out drill. And what makes this very unique is if you're in a cost saving environment, you don't have to open a lot of different inside out uh, cutters. What you can see here is this cutter, this inside out reamer goes from six millimeters to 12 millimeters with half size increments. So today, my initial plan, I didn't verbalize it, but I had a plan of possibly doing a uh, root repair on that medial meniscus and using an inside out tunnel on the femur. I just changed things up for speed for the video, but had I done that, I could have drilled a six millimeter tunnel for my inside out and a nine millimeter tunnel on my femur without, have, without ever having to open another implant. I could have done it all with the same implant. The one thing I'll show with this video, and this is courtesy of Dr. Uh, Moinfar, is that I use the circle guide today on the tibia. It never misses. And I don't like to use never in medicine, but it doesn't. Uh, give me one second. Let's see if I can get this to work for me. I got to speed it up a little. It just comes right through the center every time. I don't know about y'all, but I, I don't like how the, with the point, I go either anterior or posterior to it. And then as it comes through, what you'll see is all you have to do is twist it and it'll, the blade will open up on itself right here. And then that's how the, the, however much the blade opens up is how the width of the tunnel is determined. So what about these rigid loop adjustables? What I did on the femur today. Now this is a fixed loop construct. And what Dr. Burns showed in 2014 is that an unlocked construct like the tightrope demonstrated 42 millimeters of total displacement just without, with, at time zero, right? That's a biomechanical failure. That's four millimeters of laxity in your ACL just from the implant alone. Whereas with a locked construct is roughly 1.3 millimeters. Remember that. So a locked construct is better than an adjustable construct. But let's look at the rigid loop. So the rigid loop adjustable, again, Dr. Barber and his group uh, looked at all these different implants. And what they found was the Arthrex, Comet, and Biomet couldn't even complete the study. The implants were already failing before the study was over. They were stretching greater than three millimeters. Smith and Nephew and Rigid Loop were the only two implants that completed the study, and Smith and Nephew had a displacement of 2.9 millimeters, whereas the Rigid Loop had a displacement of 1.7. So a fixed has a displacement of 1.3. Rigid Loop has an adjustable that you can pull up into the uh, tunnel like I did today, only 1.7. So hands down, the best adjustable button on the market. So if you're looking for efficiency, reliability, and consistency, and most importantly, strength, you're looking for the rigid loop adjustable. So let's put it all together and the talk's almost over. So here I am cleaning my notch. I don't do a notch plasty. I think it's critical to expose your PCL fibers. That way you know you have enough space to drill your femoral tunnel like you saw me do today. I always leave a little stump of the tibia. You saw that today. Uh, one little pearl I'll give you here is if you ever want to clean up this bottom stuff on the femoral condyle and you're worried about your meniscus, put in a little bit of figure four and you'll see the condyle come off the lateral meniscus. All right, now you can get your sucker shaver or your radio frequency wand in there and clean up the condyle without doing any damage to the lateral meniscus. It's a very safe and easy trick to do. So here we are, the circle reamer on my tibia. You're going to watch it come right through the middle. Doesn't miss. And then here we are. Unlike today, on this video, I did save a little footprint of the ACL, which is right here. But once again, like I said today during the talk, I would rather blow out the back wall than put my tunnel anterior. If, I'm, if my tunnel is posterior and I blow out the back wall, I still got a good tunnel because I can fix it with a button, right? If I go anterior, now I have a compromised ACL reconstruction with a higher risk of failure. So here's my tunnel right here. There's my back wall, very similar to today, one to two millimeters. And then overall, here's my graft. This one was a BTB with the button, but you can see the graft, there's no impingement. And I still got my little stump of the ACL on there for proprioceptive fibers. So I challenge everyone to 
which one's the native and which one's the revision ACL at nine months? Because one of them's a revision. That's the revision ACL at nine months. So, speed trap offers a consistent and efficient soft tissue prep. Twister offers a reliable, easy, and consistent femoral tunnel inside out drilling. You can also use it on the PCL, it's very safe. You can use it on, and you can use it for meniscal root repairs. I was, gonna, I was prepared to use it today. I think the rigid loop and in the next talk, I'll get to Interfix Advance, are both very much evidence-based evidence medicine supported consistent forms of fixation in the femur and tibia. So I think a hamstring is an excellent graft option, but I think it needs to be greater than eight millimeters. Uh, I think hamstring is equivocal to BTB, patellar tendon, in patients over the age of 20. Um, if you don't want to do a BTB and someone under the age of 20, consider a quad tendon because you're going to get that nice 10 millimeter graft. If you're going to error on the femoral tunnel, again, I can't emphasize this enough, error posterior. Don't be afraid to blow out the back wall. It's not a big deal anymore. You have a button. You have a post. Don't be afraid to blow out the back wall. It's better than going anterior. And again, blowing out the back wall is not a big deal. And just to answer the question at the beginning of the talk, my personal failure rates about 3% and over 1,000 ACLs. Thank you.